Greetings, my friends. Thank you for joining us today for this interview with Brother Stan Gleason to talk about his newest book, A Few Good Men, that's available for purchase today on PentecostalPublishing.com. Now, Brother Gleason's one of those individuals that probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but for those who may not be familiar, Brother Gleason currently serves as the Assistant General Superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church, is the Bishop of the Life Church in Kansas City, where he pastored for How many years? 35 years, and now he gets to watch his son carry the load of pastoring that church. Uh, He's also served in positions locally, at a statewide level, and then nationally, even globally. Uh, Just about anything that can be done, Brother Gleason has done it, but probably most important for this conversation is that Brother Gleason is first and foremost a husband, and you are the dad of some wonderful kids who you can choose to introduce if you would if you would like to but he has written this book a few good men recovering the goodness of biblical manhood and he's tackled some important topics that i just want us to talk through today to give a little bit of a preview of the book so brother gleason has a way maybe of just starting your your show you tell us what um what prompted you to write the book give us maybe a high level overview and then we'll we'll dig in a little bit deeper to some of the specifics as we go along so Thank you, Caleb, so much for all the kindness and the nice introduction. You forgot one thing. Okay. I'm also an all-around pretty good guy. He is an all-around pretty good guy. <laughs> Your so, wife wouldn't say bad looking either, so. Well, that's debatable. Okay. But thank you for all the kindness and the opportunities. So this book, A Few Good Men, is my attempt to recapture the imagery of manhood in the scripture. In our culture today, men are impugned, maligned, and in some cases deservedly so because they've uh, sort of, they're deadbeats or absentee or they've abdicated their role in the community, in the culture, certainly in the family. And many of the social ills of our society can be laid at the feet of men who have not stepped up and led. And so uh, I feel like a man is the key to really everything in the culture and a key to everything in the local church. And that's not to slight women in any way, but uh, this book is an attempt to elevate men, to challenge men, and to show them biblically what goodness looks like Mm. and what it feels like and how it lives and moves in a marriage, in a family, in the local church. And uh, so we we took a stab at it, and I hope it will help make a difference. I have no doubt that it that it will. I've heard you talk about this book a little bit and in referencing it, you talk about how a man leads himself how a man will lead his family or his home, and then how a man leads in the church. Maybe unpack the, I think the family and the the church are somewhat self-explanatory to some degree. When you talk about men leading themselves, what, what does that look like? So there's a chapter in the book uh, that is entitled, uh, Get the Man Right. And I tell the story in there about a teacher who uh, passed out puzzles that she had created out of magazines. She'd taken magazines and tore up pictures in big pieces. It was a low budget school, and this was many years ago. And she was trying to teach the students, these were fourth graders, how to process. And so when they came in from recess, all these pictures were cut up and laying on their desk. She said, now I want you to put your picture together. And so she was expecting quite an arduous process. Well, one little fella, I mean, he was done just like that. And she couldn't resist, so she came over to him and she said, how were you able to finish your puzzle so quickly? He said, well, mine was a picture of the world. He said, but I don't know what the world looks like, but on the other side was the picture of a man. And I know what a man looks like, so when I got the man right, the world came together. And so this book, in that chapter particularly, you know, how does a man discipline himself? How does he, what does he do every day to get better and to be what God wants him to be? So that's 
and it's essentially really what the whole idea of the book is about. That makes sense. So man leads himself well. Then you do talk a lot about what a man does in his home yes. and, and being a hero in your own home. Um, but one of the particular things, I think it's chapter three, you talk about how a man blesses his family. Mm. And I've heard you just in times when we've kind of talked off to the side, talk about the role that the blessing has played in your home uh, and even how you've passed that down to their their church. I've got a, a four-year-old, I've got a two-year-old, and we just now, it's two-month-old. So we're in a season where we're trying to figure out how do we disciple our kids, and the blessing is something that Ellery and I have been have been talking about recently. But maybe talk for a second, What what is it? Why is it important? What, what has that looked like in your, your home? Thank you so much. So I was privileged to be raised in a home where my father understood the power of the blessing, and that was also handed to him by his father and mother, the power of the blessing. So essentially, the Lord said to Abraham, he said, in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. And in that chapter, I'm postulating that what a man does can bring a blessing, or we could say a curse, on his family. And there are stories in there in the, from the 20, 20th and 21st centuries to illustrate that. But more importantly, the biblical idea is, why was Potiphar's house blessed? It was blessed because there was a man in that house named Joseph. And why is a man's company blessed that he works for? The, a man shouldn't think, well, I'm just, you know, earning a paycheck and punching the clock. No, he's elevating that company because he can attract the blessing of God. So a man's wife and children are blessed as he is the husband and the father by the principles he lives by by the attitude that he demonstrates, by the leadership that he provides. I also argue that God blesses a local church because of the man that pastors that church. I think that's very demonstrable in, you know, in today's world and even biblically. So this whole idea that the man is the funnel and the filter through which the blessing and the favor of God can flow down through is very important, and we attempt to try to explain that to men. I love it. I know you'll talk just kind of to parents. There's going to be some dads that are watching this. Is there anything practical that you would say um, just to them, whether it's in the book or whether it's just something you and your family did, that today, whenever I go home, I could bless my family by fill in the blank? So I think one of the things we're saying in the book is that a man needs to be the priest of his home. If he has that imagery in mind so that the home is not a place just to feed, clothe, you know, place to take showers <laughs> and to get on your devices and be entertained, but the home is, should be a temple. That's how we should look at it. Uh, this was the attitude in the Old Testament. Teach your children when you sit down, when you get up, when you're walking. Uh, this was the attitude in the first century church. They went from house to house, many various homes. You see uh, the jailer's household being saved and Lydia's household and, and uh, Cornelius's household. So the, uh, the house is a, you know, if, if parents are relying on the church and the youth group and the Sunday school ministry, the children's ministry, to do all the discipling, the children are not going to be discipled. And so the home is a place where there should be scriptures read and heard. There should be prayer as a family. That's how I was raised. That's how I raised my children. Family altars, you know, not every day. Once a week is, I would say, more than sufficient to gather the family together. We're going to read the scriptures. We're going to pray. And one other thing I want to say, I learned this from my dad. We don't typically think of peace as a weapon when we're talking about spiritual warfare. In other words, how to control the atmosphere of our home. But I've refused to allow chaos to be in my house. Uh, debate and arguing that, be, that was beyond healthy 
was never allowed. And uh, my dad lived and operated in peace. Peace is a powerful spiritual weapon. For example, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What about our feet? Jesus said, you know, I'm going to put, you know, you'll trample upon scorpions and serpents. And then Paul said, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. So there's something about walking in peace. And I tell this story in the book, and I'll share it real quick. So we lived in a house for eight years uh, with all four of our children. And when we sold the house, the lady of the house that bought our house from us, she called my wife one day and she said, is this Marlene Gleason? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, who are you people? <laughs> and my wife was like, what do you mean? She goes, no, who are you people? She said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. What, what are we talking about? She said, I bought your house and you have left something behind in your house. And my wife's thinking, what? A pair of shoes, you know, a, a baseball? She said, what did we leave behind? She said, I feel something in this house I have never felt before. Marlene said, what is it? She said, peace. Wow. That's priceless. Wow. So uh, we don't only talk about it. We try to model it. I love it. I smiled whenever you're telling that because one of my dad's statements that he would make to our family is, we will not allow chaos in this house. It just, it was never was never an option. And the Bible even talks about being peacemakers. Mm. It implies that somebody can walk in a room and they can change the atmosphere of that of that room. And I hope as men, we own that responsibility. Yeah, and, and I'll just, as a concluding statement about peace, from, from me, I want to say that the only thing that's better than winning a spiritual battle is never having to fight it. <laughs> there you go. Because you live in peace. Sure. If our families could avoid certain things simply because we said, not, not in this house. Amen. I love it. So how a man leads himself, a man leads his, his family. Then your closing chapter, chapter 8, you, you title, Every Pastor Needs a Friend. And the opening verse here is, I have no one else like Timothy. You talk about how men can lead in, in the church. Talk about that. Every pastor needs a friend. What do you mean when you, when you say that? So when I read that text where Paul said, I had no one like-minded like Timothy, if I'm, in, if I'm alone and I read that and reflect on 40 years of pastoring, I can get real emotional real quick because there's very few men in a local church that really catch the spirit of their pastor. It takes an unusual man. It takes a spiritual man a man of prayer, a man who watches his pastor, who pays attention. Uh, I remember one day, I, it was after a Sunday service, we did a great service, an altar call, God moved and blessed, and I was walking up the center aisle, down the center aisle to the vestibule to try to see as many people as I could before they left, and one of my leaders reached out. He was a big old man. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he stopped me. And I, you know, I looked up at him. I said, hey, how you doing? He goes, how are you, pastor? I said, I'm fine. And I started, he wouldn't let me go. He said, no, pastor, how are you? That's a different question. Sure. <laughs> and so I paused. I said, why are you asking me that? And tears began to come down his face. And he said, this morning at 3 o'clock, the Lord woke me up. He said, I saw your face the size of a harvest moon. I said, oh, that was a nightmare. <laughs> he said, no, pastor. God was calling me to intercede for you. I got out of my bed. I went out into another room. So I went to stir my wife, and I prayed for you. You can't put a price on that sort of an attitude. So Timothy, he got Paul. He studied Paul. He was discipled by Paul. So I have a pa I've had a passion ever since I was a 25-year-old pastor to partner with men that God gave me in our church and then to see those men catch the vision, catch the spirit, catch the attitude. I tell a story in that book. I won't take the time to unpack right now. But a man stood up when I needed somebody like a Timothy to say, 
that is my pastor. And it changed the attitude and the atmosphere of our church, uh, not, not the church in Kansas City, another church we served. And it, 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 I cannot tell you what happened when my Timothy said, uh, I catch my pastor. I love it. I love it. Again, he un- expounds on that a lot more in this book, A Few Good Men. Um, we're going to kind of move towards the end here, but I want to give you a chance. You talk about A Few Good Men, again, recovering the goodness of biblical manhood. Uh, you've talked a lot about your dad, even throughout this conversation. Tell me a little bit about some of the good men in your life. So in terms of ministry leaders, um, I've had five men that have shaped my life. It's interesting, uh, this is another subject, but when I really analyzed this, I realized each one of them provided a role in the fivefold ministry for me in shaping my faith. And of course, the most important person to me was my father, who was a called teacher. He taught at Apostolic Bible Institute for 35 years. That's where my brother and I and my two sisters were raised, and we all graduated from the school. And I go all over the world, and people come up to me everywhere. Your dad was... One lady recently told me, she said, I had your dad at 8 o'clock Monday morning for intertestamental history, and she said he was better than a triple espresso. (laughs) He just had one of those contagious attitudes, and it wasn't fake. It was authentic. It was real. So he was my teacher. My pastor from the time I was 14 into my 20s was a man named Robert Sabin. He was my pastor. I wanted to preach just like him. I was always a front row kid, and I tried to capture, you know, his ability to communicate. My first pastor also was his pastor. His name was S.G. Norris. He was the founder of the Bible College. His grandson, Professor David Norris, as we all know, teaches at UGST, and actually was my youth pastor when I was in high school. So he's had a profound influence in my life. I'll have to slide him in there. Um, so S.G. Norris was my apostle. Uh, the, the man carried spiritual authority like few I've ever seen. My father-in-law, Charles Dyson, was a prophet, and I don't have time to explain how I know that, but I do know that without a doubt. And uh, he passed away six years after I was married to the lovely, the beautiful, the gracious, the Queen Marlene, his baby daughter. But what a profound impact that man had on my life. In fact, he left us two books, Actions Are Weighed and No Continuing City, sermon books, but very powerful. Last but not least, my evangelist was Norman Pasley's father, okay. Norman Pasley, uh, number one. Okay. And he saw something in me that I did not see myself, and he captured my heart. Him and his wife evangelized for many years, and he taught me how to love people how to disciple people, how to invest in people. And so these are the men that in my 20s, of course, my father my whole life, but in my 20s and my formative years of ministry helped shape me to whatever it's turned out to be. I love that. I uh, want to give you kind of a closing closing word. Um, again, talking to men, talking to church leaders, talking to pastors, uh, obviously some very important truths wrapped into into this book. Um, and maybe two-part question, just as this book is distributed and hopefully in the hands of thousands, if not tens of thousands of men, what do you hope that it accomplishes? Um, but then specifically even talking to pastors and church leaders, I know you've done something unique, and one of the impetuses for writing this book is based on a way that you've handled Father's Day. So maybe talk a little bit about that and how you see this being a resource that could be used for Father's Day. Thank you for that question. So for years at our church in Kansas City, we... Uh, We celebrated Father's Day, as all churches do, I'm sure. But Father's Day, I was more passionate about preaching on Father's Day than really Easter, uh, Christmas, even Pentecost Sunday, which I'm super passionate about all of those Sundays. But Father's Day, because I felt like there was a greater impact or opportunity for a trickle-down residual effect that would outlive the shelf life of the sermon which, you know, is over after the altar call. And so uh, we use Father's Day as a resource to train men because I feel like 
you know, if, if a man is doing his job well, then the family is not going to have to come to church to get all the dysfunction worked out. They're going to work it out at the house. And if he's healthy and if his marriage is healthy, then he's going to have a healthy family, and it only enhances the overall health and quality of the congregation. So that was my attitude. Uh, and that really is the, uh, the idea behind the book, Get the Man Right, and then everything else lines up. So for years on Father's Day, we would have a theme, like a military theme or a cowboy theme, which still works well in Kansas City, uh, even though we're Kansas City Chiefs you are fans the Chiefs. there. Yep. Uh, I thought I would mention that, a shameless promotion for our local team. And then um, we, so we would have a theme, you know, even a, a sports theme. And so, like, I remember one Sunday, we had a cowboy theme, so we had cowboy boots, and we had a bunch of tables on the front, and then we would buy these little paperback books uh, at Christian book distributors or somewhere, right. and, you know, you can get them for a dollar or two, and we'd have hundreds of them, and then we'd have dads send up their kids or granddads, their grandkids, and, you know, go go up there and give them this offering, and so they'd put their offering in the cowboy boot for apostolic man. It was a, raise, a way to raise our offering for apostolic man. And then they would get a book, and it was so cute to see those little kids come back, and they're giving their dad or their grandpa a gift. And it made them feel important. Sure. It made the dads and the granddads feel blessed, and, and it was such an important part. So I was talking to Robin Johnston one day, and I said, do we have anything like this? And he said, I don't think we do. He said, you're just the man to do it. So I, through the years, I've been privileged to be invited to 60 men's conferences, just 60th was in Oklahoma wow. in September. Congratulations, Oklahoma. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and so we were able to put together this book from the messages and ideas that we presented that I felt were the most effective and most salient to the issue of men recapturing the goodness of biblical manhood. And so now pastors have a resource, yeah. and they're less than $10, and they can buy them by the box. And Father's Day is really the best time to present them. And so my hope is that we can get this book into the hand of every man in every one of our churches and uh, help add value to the family, the congregation, and hopefully the kingdom of God. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for writing A Few Good Men. Thank you for taking time to talk about it today. Again, as he's already mentioned, these these books are not incredibly expensive. You can find them at PentecostalPublishing.com. Uh, in case you can't tell, it's a nice hardcover book. It's designed to be a gift book uh, if, if you choose to use it in that kind of capacity, to try and get into the hands of as many men as you can within your local church. But we know that you will be blessed by it, so Brother Gleason, thank you for for authoring this book. Thank you for taking time to talk about it today. We pray God's blessings on each of you. Again, you can find it at PentecostalPublishing.com today. We hope to see you soon.